promised uh, Becky Ball that I would say a word about the Jacob Terrell oh. voice. He's actually in my first concert as music director. I'm Dan Alcott, by the way, if you don't know who I am. Sorry. My manner has got the better of me. Um, my first concert as music director of the Oak Ridge Symphony, we performed a symphony by Brahms, and not accidentally, we performed a piece of music by a living composer um, named Jacob Terveltwis, um, who goes by, mostly he just likes to be called Jacob TV. And he is, describes himself as an avant pop composer. He used to be a rock and roll musician, and then he uh, came to classical music, which is not that unusual. Paul McCartney now fashions himself a classical composer, and, um, and many others. But uh, I heard some music by Jacob Terabeltes at a League of American Orchestra's uh, composers preview. I'm just talking long enough for Scott to give sewer classes. <laughs> and I was immediately taken with the music. Um, I liked his sensibility, he's a very interesting composer, and so I had programmed one of his cello concertos previously and done the United States premiere conducting that with my colleague uh, Wesley Baldwin from UT. So when I was offered the job uh, as music director of the Oak Ridge Symphony, I thought, oh, Wes has learned this very difficult piece, let's do it again. I love getting uh, another shot, especially a new piece of music. And then I found out that I had actually given the um, United States premiere of a couple of other pieces of music. Jacob TB writes, he likes to write with mixed media. So one of these pieces was for boombox and cello. So I like to play that piece that I played. And then when I play that, kids want to play it because they're like, I want to carry a boombox on stage. Um, but Jacob has a very advanced sense of, of um, mixing popular music and things and um, composer that I really like. Anyway, the reason we're playing one movement of his trio, which is called the Nevea Hair Care Styling Moose Trio. Because he wrote this trio, he's commissioned to write a trio for a group called the Storioni Trio. And because two of their members have Storioni uh, string instruments. And they didn't have a name for the thing, but they were sitting around uh, at the recording session. The piece was going to be premiered and recorded at the same time. And they started talking about, hey, your hair looks nice. What product do you use? Oh, I use Nevea. They all three use the same hair product. So Jacob TV, being the avant pop composer that he is, said that's the name of the trio. And they ended up one. So we're playing Moose from this trio. And the reason we're playing is because I know if I make these guys play this movement enough, eventually they'll learn the whole trio. <laughs>
I promised uh, Becky Ball that I would say a word about the Jacob Terrell oh. voice. He's actually in my first concert as music director. I'm Dan Alcott, by the way, if you don't know who I am. Sorry. My manners got the better of me. Um, my first concert as music director of the Oak Ridge Symphony, we performed a symphony by Brahms, and not accidentally, we performed a piece of music by a living composer um, named Jacob Terveltwis, um, who goes by, mostly he just likes to be called Jacob TV. And he is, describes himself as an avant pop composer. He used to be a rock and roll musician, and then he uh, came to classical music, which is not that unusual. Paul McCartney now fashions himself a classical composer, and, um, and many others. But uh, I heard some music by Jacob Terabeltes at a League of American Orchestras uh, composers preview. I'm just talking long enough for Scott to give sewer classes. <laughs> and I was immediately taken with the music. Um, I liked his sensibility, he's a very interesting composer, and so I had programmed one of his cello concertos previously and done the United States premiere conducting that with my colleague uh, Wesley Baldwin from UT. So when I was offered the job uh, as music director of the Oak Ridge Symphony, I thought, oh, Wes has learned this very difficult piece, let's do it again. I love getting uh, another shot, especially a new piece of music. And then I found out that I had actually given the um, United States premiere of a couple of other pieces of music. Jacob TB writes, he likes to write with mixed media. So one of these pieces was for boombox and cello. So I like to play that piece that I played. And then when I play that, kids want to play it because they're like, I want to carry a boombox on stage. Um, but Jacob has a very advanced sense of, of um, mixing popular music and things and um, composer that I really like. Anyway, the reason we're playing one movement of his trio, which is called the Nevea Hair Care Styling Moose Trio, because he wrote this trio, he's commissioned to write a trio for a group called the Storioni Trio, and because two of their members have Storioni uh, string instruments. And they didn't have a name for the thing, but they were sitting around uh, at the recording session. The piece was gonna be premiered and recorded at the same time. And they started talking about, hey, your hair looks nice. What product do you use? Oh, I use Nevet. They all three use the same hair product. So Jacob TV, being the avant pop composer that he is, said that's the name of the trio. And then ended up one. So we're playing Moose from this trio. And the reason we're playing is because I know if I make these guys play this movement enough, eventually they'll learn the whole trio. <laughs> Thank you. 
this time we're doing something based on a book that a friend has written. In 1977, Sue and I left the island of Manhattan and migrated to the island of Vancouver in British Columbia. And uh, one of the things that happened is that the, we made the acquaintance of a great couple and lifelong friends, Janet and Dennis Danielson. And Dennis is a uh, author and a professor at the University of British Columbia and has written a really neat book called The Book of the Cosmos. And Janet is a composer and a professor at Simon Fraser University and uh, has composed our piece tonight and we're really delighted with it. I'm going to ask her just to give you a brief introduction to it. And the, the piece is in six movements and before each movement there will be a brief reading from Dennis's book to uh, get, because of what each movement is based on. So here's Janet. Thank you very much, Scott, and I'd like, first of all, to thank the Oak Ridge Civic uh, Music Association for making this uh, piece possible, really, in this concert. And thank you uh, for being intrepid enough to come out and hear a lengthy work by a living composer. So that's great. I'll just uh, run through very quickly the more extensive program notes, but there's six pieces, so I have to kind of keep a lot in memory. The first piece, well, the six pieces go through views of the cosmos from, from six different uh, periods of history. The first very, very early uh, from the book of Job and the idea of uh, creation and the division of light and darkness and the beginning of time. And I thought, it must have been time that ordered everything. So I thought, what better um, image of time than Richard Feynman's wonderful, wonderful, one of his wonderful bongo solos. So, so you'll hear the waves from the other instruments and a bongo solo coming in and putting it all in order. And the second movement um, is uh, about microcosm and macrocosm. This is a very popular idea in the medieval period, as above, so below. And the idea that above the uh, that sublunary feet sphere, everything was perfect and ordered by harmony. And then if something goes wrong, you have boring atoms. So uh, that idea completely fell out of favor and then came bolting into uh, public interest again a couple of years ago when uh, someone noticed that the interior of a mouse brain was identical to a simulation of the e evolution of the universe. So you'll see those slides in image. Uh, the third piece, wonderfully sly and smooth motion, is, uh, uh, takes you through a 24-hour day, starting a midday, going into the small hours of the night, and then coming out again. Uh, the fourth, uh, no clockwork, is more precise. You'll see the image there is a wonderful art millery sphere. Of course, we know since uh, quantum mechanics that things aren't quite as neat and tidy as, as one was thought in the 18th century. Towards uh, the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, had a wonderful discovery, much underplayed. This is such an important discovery. It was, it was uh, the uh, spectra of stars. We work out the composition of stars through spectroscopy. So you'll see uh, two slides uh, from the NASA library. And what you'll hear is uh, the um, spectrum for steel. And you can actually follow the slide a little bit, you'll hear that twice, and then you'll hear clay, which starts off with a bit of a bang and then kind of fizzles out. You'll hear that twice, and then the end, a little bit of celebration of light. And then the very last one is about the formation of carbon, which is a, a, an awe-inspiring um, event, and you can read the details in the program. Um, and the uh, image is of the Crab Nebula, which is a very dusty nebula, and they hypothesize that there must, it must have been one that uh, brought a lot of carbon. So please, I hope you enjoy the piece. Thank you very much for listening. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the Earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what great space is sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone 
when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst forth from the womb, when I made clouds its garment, and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed bounds for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far shall you come, and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stopped. Have you commanded the morning since your days began, and caused the dawn to know its place?
world, always changing, persists in harmony. A covenant secure unites the warring atoms. The trailblazing sun leads forth the rosy dawn. The evening star makes way for night, the moon's dominion. The eager ocean currents do not transgress their bounds. Safe fence remains the earth against invading waters. It is love who joins all these. Reigning over land and sea, the universe itself is ruled by love. If love let slip the reins, whatever now keeps peace would fall to constant warring. Beauty, trust, harmony dissolving into discord. Love consecrates the bond uniting diverse peoples. In marriage too, love spins the cords of holy union. And love, again, decrees, let faithful friendship be. O oh, human race, how happy if equally your minds were ruled by love who rules the universe.
planets enclosed in the orb of the moon, I call the globe of mortality, because it is the peculiar empire of death. In the midst of this globe of mortality hangeth this dark star or ball of the earth and water balanced and sustained in the midst of the thin air only with that propriety which the wonderful workman hath given at the creation to the center of this globe with his magnetical force vehemently to draw and hail unto itself all other such elementary things as retain the like nature. This ball, every 24 hours, by natural, uniform, and wonderful, sly and smooth motion, rolleth round, making with his period our natural day, whereby it seems to us that the huge, infinite, immovable globe of stars should sway and turn about.
it would seem that nature takes great pleasure in series of waves and oscillations, for we discover them in almost every motion. In the same manner, a ship travels through a series of oscillating waveforms upon the sea. The larger the ship is, the larger the billow is required to make it rise and fall. A small skiff moves with each wave, whether large or small. And in the time it takes the worship to rise and fall only once, the skiff endures several minor risings and fallings which together make up the large one. And this is how all the spheres appear to pursue their courses through cosmic space. All finally revolve about the universal midpoint, but the larger each body is, the less yielding it is, and the simpler are its oscillations. Naturally, things there are quieter and more uniform than they are on the surface of the ocean. The universal wind which sets all things in motion is more reliable and in itself steadier than the east wind that blows between the tropics here on Earth and more fitted to the preservation of the bodies which it propels. Time and space through the movement of each body are bound up together within the structure of the cosmos. Thus, apparent order ought to be the simplest order, and the larger the expanse of time we wish to make sense of, the more complex will be the order we have to comprehend. How systematically and precisely does the revolution daily of the heavens meet out for us the days and hours and all their parts to whatever purpose we may devote them. No clockwork is more precise than the daily course of each fixed star.
today it is possible to probe the origin of carbon itself through its synthesis in the nuclear reactions deep inside evolving stars. Carbon is the fourth most common atom in our galaxy after hydrogen, helium, and oxygen, but it isn't very abundant. A carbon nucleus can be made by merging three helium nuclei, but a triple collision is tolerably rare. It would be easier if two helium nuclei would stick together to form beryllium, but beryllium is not very stable. Nevertheless, sometimes, before the two helium nuclei can come unstuck, a third helium nucleus strikes home, and a carbon nucleus results. And here, the internal details of the carbon nucleus become interesting. It turns out that there is precisely the right resonance within the carbon to help this process along. We can shatter glass with intense sound waves, it's necessary to tune the audio generator to the specific resonance for that particular goblet. And then to turn up the volume until the glass vibrates so violently that it literally explodes. The specific resonances within atomic nuclei are something like that, except in this case the particular energy enables the parts to stick together rather than to fly apart. In the carbon atom, the resonance just happens to match the combined energy of the beryllium atom and the colliding helium nucleus. Without it, there would be relatively few carbon atoms. Similarly, the internal details of the oxygen nucleus play a crucial role. Oxygen can be formed by combining helium and carbon nuclei, but the corresponding resonance level in the oxygen nucleus is half a percent too low for the combination to stay together easily. Had the resonance level in the carbon been 4% lower, there would be essentially no carbon. Had the level in the oxygen been only half a percent higher, virtually all the carbon would have been converted to oxygen. Without that carbon abundance, none of us would be here now.
not here to defend himself. <laughs> have to deal with it.
Thank you.